Welcome to Inbox Segment Part 10. It's not many weeks after Part 9, but there's a very special item that I thought was worth telling you about sooner rather than later. It's an item in the mail, something that this YouTube channel rarely receives. It's come from Jeff, VK2AVR, and the Manly Warringah Radio Society. In the tradition of another YouTube channel, we'll use a big knife to crack this sucker open. bit of plastic base and in here a row of LEDs so that's the trophy from flagpole day 2015 it was easy to enter and fun to win maybe you'll pick it up next year and now on to your comments great to hear from Carl from State of Electronics that there'll be more videos in the State of Electronics series if you haven't done so, please subscribe to State of Electronics on YouTube. Radio Certification wanted to know about HD and widescreen. The good news is you've got it back. This camera was previously out of service, but has now returned as my main camera for shooting these videos. VA3 OSO wanted to know about these poles. They extend up to 8 or 9 metres, and I frequently use them for portable antennas. I call them screwed poles, but in other countries they go by other names, like roach poles or just simply telescopic poles. They are about 40 millimetres in diameter and have about 8 or 9 sections, each about a metre long, giving a good height. Uh, they're also very light, so ideal for portable QRP operating. Anyway, you can get them from various fishing stores. Or if you're in Australia, you can order them from Haverford online and they'll be delivered to you. Certainly one of the best investments you can make in amateur radio portable operating. Some good comments on the Radio Shop history videos in Melbourne. Thanks for Dave, VK3ASE, for suggesting Waltham's Trading Company. There's a very good resource online done by Will, VK6UU, who has scanned all the copies of Amateur Radio magazine from the 1930s through to the 1980s and he's still adding a month's issue at a time every few days so have a look at that link if you're into historical radio stuff I'll include it below I might go through those old magazines and have a look at the electronic and radio shops in Melbourne from the 30s through to the 60s and visit them in similar video to the last two hopefully in the next few weeks or so on 160 meters AM, Thomas Lovell wanted to know what transceiver I was using. It was a Seacom 40B. It's a local Australian made solid state transceiver from the early 1970s. About this big, fairly light, solid state and AM. Uh, there weren't that many years when valves were phasing out and SSB was coming in, but the late 60s, early 70s were about that time. Before shipping moved to VHF, there was a lot of use made of the lower HF segment and upper medium wave segment around 2 MHz. Um, I think in the UK they called it trawler band. You might see old electronic magazines from that era with transistor radios with an extra band covering say 2 to 4 or 6 MHz which they sometimes called marine band or trawler band. Anyway, that's where a lot of the small ships and boats operated before they got VHF. Anyway, I converted it to 160 meters. I put in a crystal for 1825 and also 1843, and I made the receiver tunable just by replacing its crystal controlled local oscillator with a tuned circuit. So there's a little bit of frequency agility on receive, but I'm crystal controlled on transmit. So that's the CCOM radio. There were other types which occasionally come up at ham fests. So that's on earthing. You're absolutely right, with a kite antenna, you do need a one meg resistor from the antenna down to earth. I did have that on the back of my CCOM, although I didn't show it, I probably should have done in the video. If you don't have a resistor, you can get jolts. Even if there isn't a lightning storm, there can be static buildup. Even when I haven't been using kite antennas, just something a few meters high on a squid pole, there's been occasions where I've touched the end of the wire and got a jolt and also damaged a transceiver as well. Luckily it was a home brew rig, a Beach 40, and I was just able to replace the front end transistor. So that was all fine, but something to look out for 
Remember, a one mega ohm resistor across from the bottom of the kite antenna wire down to earth to keep your equipment safe. As to the dog, well, it took quite a lot of interest in the kite, as well as me, but eventually ran away, which was fortunate because it was a bit of a pest. Mike VK2IG, yep, there was a big difference between when the antenna wire was vertical and when the kite was low, and it was more like that. Probably at least a 10 dB difference in the received signal and also in the transmit signal. So I like your idea of using a squid pole so the bottom seven or eight meters of the wire is vertical, it's held off the ground, and then the kite wire antenna can still move around, but at least it won't touch the ground unless the kite has crashed. Love that idea, and I will try it. Good to hear from Josh, who was VK3FJOS, who's now VK3VWS. For others watching, that new call sign will allow Josh more bands and also to be able to use homebrew gear on the air. Good luck with your Beach 40 and hope to see you at QRP by the Bay next Saturday, November 14. It's been a month since Minimum QRP came out and there's been some great sales, over 600 in the first 30 days. If you haven't got yours yet, please visit Amazon.com and type in Minimum QRP to find it. There's also information on my website at vk3ye.com. Available for under $5 US, it's recommended for the beginning, returning or more experienced amateur, wishing to do more with under 5 watt amateur radio. That's been another inbox segment. If you've got any comments, leave them below and I'll answer any questions next time round.